which is the former power series that you get by using as coefficients of vector space dimensions of the <coughs> homogeneous component of your ring. And I mean, it's uh, it was one of the reasons for Hilbert to introduce homological algebra to prove that the Hilbert series is <coughs> rational. Okay, so somehow Hilbert invented free resolution to be able to prove that the Hilbert series is a rational series. He proved Hilbert series theorem to be able to deduce that the Hilbert series is rational. Nowadays we know that the rationality of the Hilbert series is, is we, it's a weaker statement. So you can prove it without knowing the Hilbert series theorem. But this was its original motivation. So this is a series, is rational. Now, if you see such a, such a, suppose now is R is Cosur. So if we R is Cosur, we know that the resolution of K gr it goes like this, minus 1 to power. Sorry. Uh, in the definition of Cosur ring, uh, the minimal free resolution must be fine. No, I mean, of course, can be finite, but if it is finite, it's a polynomial ring, which, okay, it's, it's a Kuzu ring, but maybe not the most interesting ring, right? Uh, Among the Kuzu ring. You mean uh, not necessarily finite? So we want, we want a notion of, of Kuzu ring which includes a polynomial ring. But, I mean, the polynomial ring is somehow uh, very special within the, within the Kuzu ring, because the resolution is, is, is linear, but it's also finite. But sometimes the resolution, in mo very often, is linear but not finite. And these are the interesting Kozur rings. The polynomial, of course, we, it's like you know, you want an inclusive, and and then that case, uh, the Hilbert series, uh, the Hilbert series of the polynomial ring is easy, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, mention, uh, this is the dimension of R uh, as a vector space. So this is not the Poincaré series, this is Hilbert series, the standard Hilbert series, the one that you, you, you use to compute cruel dimension, for instance. Usually, uh, uh, when... You want to call this Poincaré series? <laughs> no, I, I mean, mean it, uh, uh, Hilbert series, Hilbert function can be uh, computed by alternating sum. And this is the point that I'm going to make. <coughs> this is the point that I'm going to make. Okay. And... Uh, Okay, so I, w I, w I was going to write down things like this because now we want to relate the Hilbert series of R with the Poincaré series of R. And then the, the connection comes from the... So this beta are really the beta R of K, right? Beta R of K. And so on. And now we, we do what he was suggesting. So we know that we know how the uh, vector space dimension behave on, on exact complexes, right? So we can turn this into more I mean, formal statement about Hilbert series. If you have uh, an exact complex of modules, you can say that the alternating sum of the Hilbert series must vanish. So we can write down this thing. So with the Hilbert series of K, what is the Hilbert series of K? Is one. Okay. It's because it's vector, it's concentrated in degree zero. So we get one. One. Then we have, we have beta one. Uh, beta one R K copies of R shifted by one. So what is the Hilbert series of R shifted by 1? Is the Hilbert series of R, but multiplied by Z, because the shift brings me Z over there. 
Then what we are, I have to subtract or to add the Hilbert series of this guy. What is the Hilbert series of this guy is I have beta 2 R K copies of um, I forgot, I forgot, sorry, I forgot the ring. I, I forgot this, this guy. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So once again. 1 minus the Hilbert series of R, which is this, plus, let me just say beta 1, just by, to shorten the notation. Beta 1, Z, Hilbert series of R, plus beta 2 z squared uh, Hilbert series of r and so on. This must be equal to 0. Okay, you, c you see what's, what's happened is that you, you have this one, then in the rest you can collect the Hilbert series of r, and what you get is the Poincaré series only with alternating signs. Okay, so this can be you can play a little bit with these formal expressions and since we want to so you, you can write it just saying that the Hilbert series computed in Z times the Poincaré series computed in minus Z this gives one or if you want you know if you want to somehow say something about the Poincaré series you can say that the Poincaré series computed in Z is 1 over the Hilbert series computed in minus Z. And this is amazing, just, if we want to keep in mind the, say, sir, sir, question, we have a very nice rational expression for the Poincaré series, for, the, okay, somehow the data which is contained in the Poincaré series is the same amount of information which is contained in the Hilbert series. It's just I mean, this formal transformation which relate one to the other. But we can say if, if uh, the ring is Cajul, then the Poincaré series is rational. Indeed, a rational of very nice form. And, and then from here we see the numerical abstraction. Suppose I'm giving you a ring which is defined by quadrics, and I ask you, is this a Cajul ring or not? You easily compute the Hilbert series. You get this Hilbert series, you take this, in this ratio, and you expand it. If it happens that one of the, the coefficients of this expansion is negative, this cannot be a Cajun ring. Right? Because this, this equality force, the coefficient of this series to be positive. <laughs> because if it is an equality with a, on this side, you have positive coefficient. Okay, so there is a numerical abstraction. If R is Cajul, then the coefficients of uh, 1 divided H of R minus Z are positive. Okay, maybe you could say positive. Also, zero is fine, but of course, zero means it's a polynomial ring and it's a extreme situation. Suppose you have a ring which is which is not a polynomial ring. If if it is Cajun, then this coefficient may must be all positive. Okay, and it is easy to find a ring which is defined by quadrics, such that when you play this game, you see a negative coefficient. So that ring cannot be Cajun. It is defined by quadrics, but it cannot be Cajun by numerical, say obstructions. Right. The obstruction is more in the Hilbert function, not in, in the <coughs> equation. Okay, and the, and the typical the typical situation is the following. Take a polynomial ring in four variables modulo five generic quadrics.
and you compute the Hilbert series, so this is our ring R. You compute the Hilbert series, and you see which is 1, 4z, plus 5z squared. You make this transformation, you expand it, and you see there is a negative coefficient. I mean, if I remember well, and at stage Z6, you see a minus 29 or something like that. So here is 1 plus 4 plus 5, plus 4z plus 5z squared. There are 10 quadrics in 4 variables, you mod out 5, you are left with 5. And the 5 quadrics, they span the cubics. So this is the Hilbert series. Okay. So any ring which has this Hilbert series is, is quadratic, but <coughs> cannot be causal by numerical restriction. And of course, you, you, if you like, uh, say, uh, projective variety, you say, okay, this is an Artinian ring, it does not exist in the geometric world. But you can, I mean, it is not so difficult to see that if you have, if you have, uh, if you have a Koei-Macaulay ring, and you mod out a uh, non-zero divisor of degree one, it is Kozul if and only if the, the, the hyperplane section is Kozul. So we, you can make a statement like this. Uh, there, are, there are no curves. If you take a curve, it's a reducible curve, if you like, which has this Hilbert series, cannot be Kozul, if it is, uh, which is arithmetically comical. Suppose you have an irreducible curve, which is arithmetically comical, which has this Hilbert series, cannot be Kozul, because you pass to the Artinian reduction. If it is Kozul, it will stay Kozul. And this obstruction, you have it at the Artinian reduction. Right? So it's really something that you can play also for, uh, for rings which come from, from uh, irreducible varieties. What happens if the number of quadrat equations is bigger, bigger than it, it may be Kozul? If this is, I mean, the situation is the following. Okay, maybe in, in a moment we will see that Tate uh, construction for the complete intersection tells us if I have a complete intersection of quadrics, it is Kozul. Mm -hmm. So the complete intersection of quadrics, they are Kozul because we keep under control the resolution of the residue field via Tate construction. And we see it, it is so. So when we, if we are talking about taking generic quadrics, so if you take less than the number of variables, it's a complete intersection. So it is causal. Then when you pass the number of variables, there is an interval where the generic it is non-causal. When you are, uh, we are c close to the other limit, there is again an interval where it is causal. So th if you take a bunch of generic quadrics and you ask yourself whether it is causal or not, Somehow it depends. In the, say, the, they are few, they are this Kozul. Then there is a very large interval where it is not Kozul. And then there is a final the interval where it is a, again Kozul. So it, it's very difficult to make a statement uh, whether being Kozul is generic, it's a, an open condition or not. It depends on the, on the, on the uh, numerical restriction that you impose. Okay. Okay, so uh, this was just to give you a way of checking that something is non-casual. We have this numerical abstraction. It's the first thing that you should check if you are, uh, if you are able to control the Hilbert series. Usually the Hilbert series is something that you can compute without too much effort, right? For instance, I with a computer, how do you check casualness with a computer? You cannot, mm -hmm. because you can, co you can start to compute the resolution of the CD field with a computer. But you can only can compute finite number of steps, and there is a, there is, a, I mean, there is a family of examples showing that the first place where you see a nonlinear series can be anywhere. So, if you tell me 300, I can produce a ring in six variables, such that for 300 steps, 
the solution will be linear and at step 301 it will be non-linear. So no longer, no, no matter how long is the finite initial piece that you compute, then the bad thing can happen in the next step. So this is somehow rules out any, uh, there were, there were, I mean, uh, you know, questions like, suppose I have n variables and I can compute the first n step or two n steps or three n steps. Can I be sure that it is causal if for three n steps it is linear? No, you can't. The, f the bad thing can happen in an arbitrarily high homological position. So, no way out. And, of course, you can say, okay, this is not a practical way, but can I compute the first 10 homological uh, positions, the first 10 models in the three resolutions? Usually the numbers, they grow exponentially, unless it is a complete distraction. So again, after two or three steps, you are, you, are, you are writing matrices representing maps of size some thousand, then some hundred thousand. And it is, I mean, quite clear that you cannot compute too much. I mean, going to position five or six, it's already a lot. So it's, it's difficult with a computer to distinguish causalness from non-causalness. There is no algorithm. So there is no finite algorithm at the moment to check if, if a given ring is causal or not. But of course, you can, there are these initial things that you can check. Computable series, write with expansion and check whether the coefficients are positive, which is also a difficult problem sometimes check whether the coefficient in such an expansion are positive or not, but okay, you, you, you is can. Is there a criterion uh, to, using, uh, to use the polymer basis? We will, we will see in a moment, ah. okay. We will see in a moment. But who defined this notion for the first time? Uh, okay, the, the, the notion was defined in the non commutative setting by Pridi in the 1970. Then it became uh, somehow popular in the commutative setting and also in algebraic geometry there are a lot of results saying curves of this kind yes. and coordinate ring which is causal for instance maybe the most important if you take the uh, a smooth curve embedded with a canonical embedding it is causal unless it, you have those special situations where it is not quadratic. So there are a few cases where it is not quadratic but when it is quadratic it is causal. This has been proved by three different groups of, of people. I mean, it's more or less the same time, uh, about 15 years ago. And I think Kempf was the one which really, I mean, was, was asking this for geometrical uh, objects, this property for geometrical objects. Okay, so, but let's do step by step. And next thing is saying that completing the section of quadrix, they are causal. And this is something that we can check because the resolution of the residual field for completing the section is very well understood because it is of this T2 statement. Is uh, is the coordinate ring of rational normal curve, for example? Yes, it is causal. Yes. Veronese variety is also causal. The Veronese variety of the projective space it is causal. Okay, the, 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 at the moment what we know is that if R is causal, then it is quadratic. When we cannot reverse this arrow. And then we have Tate saying that if I is a complete intersection of quadrix so this is the agitate construction we know it is causal and uh, so he was saying can I check it with a Grubner basis if you have one thing which is easy to prove by means of filtration argument if your ideal is generated by monomials of degree 2, then it is causal. So a ring whose defining equation are monomials of degree 2, this is causal. The proof is, I mean, it's really very simple. And uh, it's an, uh, you, you don't compute any resolution. You just start an inductive argument and you somehow 
computing only some column ideas, you keep everything under control. And column ideas, they are easy to compute for monomial ideas. This is, roughly speaking, the proof. If you want to see the details, I can provide details anytime. So here we have, so R is defined by monomials. Uh, monomials. All degree two, then it is causal. And then comes this question. If I have a Grebner basis of quadrix, if if I can say that my ring is defined by quadrix and this quadrix has, have a nice uh, deformation to monomials via um, a one parameter family, then you can still conclude it is causal. Okay, so you, instead of writing a monomial of degree two, you can say a Grobner basis of quadrics, which is maybe the. So uh, the ring has, or maybe better, the ideal has a group. Okay. So the ring R is defined. By a Grubner basis of quadrics. Okay, so I don't know oh, oh, whether everybody in this room is familiar with this notion, but if not, I mean, Grubner basis is a way of deforming uh, ideas to monomial ideas. And th this deformation is usually compatible with homological computation. So if we deform it to a set of monomials of degree two, since monomials of degree two, we know it give causal ring. Also, Grevenor basis of quadrics give a causal ring. This is roughly speaking the, the, the argument. So if I have a ring and uh, I look at my defining ideal, which is defined by quadrics, and if I can prove that this set of quadrics they form a Grevenor basis, I'm done. The ring is causal, and this is one of the most powerful tools that we have. For instance, it was mentioned in uh, Veronese varieties, Grassmannians, for instance, all these nice and classical objects, they come with uh, a well-known set of defining equations, and usually these well-known uh, families, they form a Grubner basis. Like, for instance, Plucker relations for the Grassmannian, they form a Grubner basis. And um, Schubert varieties, all these things, determinantal, uh, varieties defined by 2 by 2 minus. All these things they are Grubner basis. Of course, it's known of this statement is easy, but it's a result, you know, of a, a lot of, you know, work which was been done in at various stages. For instance, Hodge, he proves a uh, statement about Plucker relations that in modern terms can be uh, translated into a statement about Grubner basis. Okay. Is the proof this, this proof? Yeah. This proof is, I mean, there are two things that you have to worry about. The monomial case, you first you prove it for monomials, and as I said, for monomial, it's a combinatorial game. And then you have to use the one parameter flat family. Is there always easiest one parameter? Huh? One parameter flat family? No. Already exists. It always exists, the one parameter flat family, but the <coughs> point that the the, ob the special fiber need not to be defined by quadrics. If the special fiber is defined by quadrics, we are done. This is what the content of this argument. Actually, flat family preserve the causal. I think so. Oh, you think so? Yes. But I mean, I. Uh, I mean, I. I don't see the proof right way. Let's say like this. I mean. One parameter family is flat family. Yes. So many. I mean, I, 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 perhaps I can show you the the one one equation that you can prove, one inequality concerning uh, the tor uh, dimension of tors. What you can prove is the following. Um, of course, this this. Uh, One way of this, the, the, talking about Grubner basis is through filtration defined by weights. Okay, so you 
you take some, so we, are, we have a polynomial ring in n variables, or n plus 1 if you like, and you take some weights in some vector in say, say n to the n, and you, you, you think you are giving to the polynomial ring a greater structure through this vector. Okay, so let me just see, degree of xi is yi. Then whenever you take a polynomial, which is non-zero, you can talk about the <coughs> initial part. So it's a component of highest degree of your polynomial. So this is the, the homogeneous component with respect to the, this filtration, okay? And if I take an ideal, I can define the highest I mean, uh, part of the ideal, just saying this is the ideal defined by the highest homogeneous component of the non-zero element in I. Okay. And uh, you, can, you can build up a one parameter flat family which has the idea I as general fiber and this guy as a special fiber. Okay. This is, and if you I mean, play this game in the homological world, you can prove statement like this. Suppose I'm giving you, maybe I need And say I have three ideals, or maybe I use the other way around. I have three ideals and this set of contains. Then I can compute the tor as an S modulo I modules of S modulo J1 and S modulo J2. So this, because of this containment, these <laughs> modules, they are modules of this ring. And I, then I take some homological position I, some uh, uh, internal degree J, and I compute the vector space dimension of the thing. I get an upper bound by replacing all the algebra objects by their special fiber in this deformation. So I can now, I, I write the same thing on this side, vector space dimension of tor i s mod in with respect to omega of i, and here I write s modulo in with respect to omega of j1, comma s modulo in omega of j2. So this is the statement. Uh, and when we talk about Kozulness, we are talking about tor RKK. Right, so the Kozulness is something that deals with tor RKK. Okay. And so you play this game with J1 equals the maximal idea, J2 equals the maximal idea. The initial part of the maximal idea is the maximal idea. There is no no problem. So here you are really saying that the dimension of this tor can only grow under such under such uh, transformation. And uh, the, the, this Betty number, the, this Kozul property, is really something you, that you can express in terms of uh, Betty numbers of uh, k as an R model. So this is the way in which you use this. Okay, so this, as I said, this is one of maybe the most powerful tools that we have at our disposal for proving that something is causal. Of course, when we say Gröbner basis of quadrics, we have to be, I mean, to make clear what we mean. I mean, to compute a Gröbner basis, I need to fix a system of coordinates, a set of variables in the polynomial ring, and I need to choose a term order. 
So these are two degrees of freedom that I have. So here what I mean is, if I can find a system of coordinates, and I can find a term order, such that the defining um, equation form a criminal basis, I'm done. The ring is kosher. So I have these two degrees of freedom. And the, I mean, the, the, somehow the experience says, if you are looking for a criminal basis of quadrix, you are looking for a very special system of coordinates. It's like when you have a set of monomials. If I perf perform a change of coordinates, they are no longer monomials. And I don't see it if I, that I have a criminal basis of quadrix. Maybe they don't have a criminal basis of quadrix after the change of coordinates. And it is only a very special one which bring me, bring the polynomials in the... In in generic, uh, generic coordinates is not, not the right, uh, <laughs> right. The right thing. So I mean, generic coordinates, the degree of the, you know, as so we, we know, the degree explode. The degree of the criminal base explode. If you take generic coordinates, it's roughly speaking, there is a regularity in the re reflex order and some very high number for the lexicographical uh, uh, One more question. Yeah. And then uh, the converse is true. Are is and then always... This is uh, the next topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let, me, let me conclude this. I, mean, well, I was saying, you, you, when you are looking for a grammar basis of quadrics, you are looking for a very special system of coordinates. And so, this is just to, to, I mean, to give you an idea that it's not something that you look generically. You look at some very special a set of coordinates which somehow fits well with your polynomials. Okay, so you you may ask uh, his question. I mean, can I reverse this arrow? It will be nice. I mean, to know that causalness is really something that you check through Gremlin base. In fact, you cannot because the f the, f the abstraction is this: if you have a Gremlin base of quadrics. Somehow, your ideal is forced to contain quadrics of low rank. Okay. And sometimes uh, you find uh, complete intersection which do not contain um, complete intersection of quadrics which do not contain quadrics of low rank. And this has been worked out in full detail by Eisenbach and co-authors, so this is not this is not the case because of this l low rank condition. <coughs> Reeves and Totaro. They discuss this in, in details. And for instance, but I think the, 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 ideal, the idea is very easy in the Artinian case. If I have a, an Artinian ideal, if it has a Grubner basis of quadrics, it must contain a quadric of rank 1. So it must contain a, a quadric which is the square of a linear form. And sometimes you can find a complete intersection, Artinian, which does not contain squares of linear form. So there is no way, no matter how you change coordinate, no matter how you choose the term order, there is no way of finding a Grubner basis of quadrics. So the, the example is three uh, general quadrics. in three variables. So the ideal of three general quadrics, three variables, does not contain the square of a linear form. does not contain a square, uh, a quadric of rank. So this gives uh, the, the easiest example of a ring which is kosher but does not have Gruber basis of quadric, no matter what you do. Okay. Of course, this is again an Artinian example. If you 
if you want a geometrical example, you have to go up a little bit with the numbers. I don't remember, but if you read the Eisenbach paper, it tells you the first time you find a curve which is completely in the section of quadrics and cannot have a curve of quadrics by this abstraction, this numerical abstraction. Okay, but uh, as I said before, the causal property is stable under uh, by modding out non-zero divisors of degree one. So you might ask yourself, okay, uh, I have uh, one of this uh, ring, and suppose I can describe it as a quotient of another ring of higher uh, dimension by a non-zero divisor of degree one. And maybe now I can check whether I can find a group of base of quadrics for this in this larger setting. Okay. So I have the freedom of looking for group of bases even after I mean deforming the the idea of the ring to higher dimension. So so this this stay this property here is what we call G quadratic. So G quadratic, you have a group of of quadrics in your idea. And now we define a slightly generalization. We say that R is L G quadratic, so meaning is G quadratic after lifting up if you can find ring, say R prime, which is G quadratic and element in the ring, which form a regular sequence of degree one. of elements of degree one such that R can be written as R prime modulo okay. so this is what I was saying I mean suppose I have the ring I can see my ring as a quotient of another ring by uh, a regular sequence of elements of degree one now I can look for a group of in the, in the big ring is it easier or more likely to find a group of bases in the bigger ring? Yes, because for instance, this, this uh, rank constra constraints, they tend to vanish when you allow yourself this transformation. And for instance, all the complete, so now we have, I have to change a little bit the picture here. Uh, so here. Yeah. We have now this intermediate notion, which is Lg. Okay. And the fact is that all the complete intersections are Lg quadratic. So you can al always define, the, the, the generate a complete intersection to a monomial complete intersection of quadrics if you allowed uh, lifting like this okay and the reason and then uh, maybe we will stop for today right yes the reason why this happened is a very I mean, elementary construction which suppose so now we are talking about why we can say star so we suppose I have quadrics q1, qc in a polynomial ring kx1, an suppose they form a complete intersection then I I define I pick new variables y1, yc and I look at this complete intersection of quadrics in 
see more variables. Okay, and it is clear that when I mod out the y's, I get back what I had. And now, because this is a complete intersection, the y's, they form a regular sequence modulo this, say, q1 prime. So in, in the ring, k of the axis and of the y's, modulo q1 prime, qc prime, the variables y1, yc, they form a regular sequence. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the point. And they form a regular sequence because you have started with a regular sequence. Okay. So, if we take this r, r prime, and I mod out the y's, I get back the q's. <laughs> so, r prime modulo the y's, give me back r. And they form a uh, Grebner basis because I can pick co prime leading terms. So the, I can pick as leading terms the y, the y squared. And they are co prime, and there is a, one of the first corollary of, of uh, Buchberger uh, criterion says that if you have co prime leading terms, they form automatically a Grebner basis. So these are a Grebner basis automatically because they, uh, if I pick these guys as leading terms, they are co prime. And, but that's enough. So this is a very simple reasoning which shows that any complete intersection can be deformed by two monomials if you allowed me to go first a little bit higher in the dimension so that I have more room for the transformation then I can deform two monomials. So when in the original setting somehow there is no room enough for turning around but if you allowed lifting there is room and you get such a deformation two monomials. Okay, so now the, the natural question is can we, okay, what about this arrow? Can we find a ring which is causal and cannot be deformed to monomials of degree 2 up to choosing term order, choosing, choosing coordinates and lifting up? And this is an open question at the moment. So we don't know a single example of a ring which is causal and which is not of Grebner basis type, so to say. Okay, maybe the next the next lecture I will talk a little bit about uh, somehow an effort to find such an example which led to discover new theorems, not to find a contrarian, but to discover new theorems. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, no. Thank you.